Yeah, thank you for the introduction and um, really glad to be able to participate in this workshop. Uh, currently, I'm a assistant professor at uh, Purdue University, and today I'm going to talk about some work that I've done during my uh, uh, postdoc at University of Chicago with uh, Mercedes. Um, so, um, in uh, yesterday's uh, previous talks uh, that we heard yesterday and today, we have seen a lot of study that focus on the um, the community that are composed of uh, resources and consumer type of interactions. And um, in today's talk, I'm going to focus on the antigen diversification that actually we can uh, see kind of a very strong analogy between uh, the community assembly at the level of species and at the level of strains that uh, 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 becomes these different kinds of uh, strains. So uh, we can think of like res uh, resources that uh, different species are competing for, uh, uh, for, for example, carbon sources and different kinds of nutrients. Um, um, but then like we can also consider host immunity as a kind of resources and different kinds of antigen variants are competing for these uh, renewable so uh, uh, host immunity resources so that uh, once the hosts are immune to a certain kind of variants, then this resource is kind of consumed. And then new hosts who are uh, born to the system or hosts that who forget about the uh, immune memory, then they become renewed as a new kind of resources. And then we can also think of interactions between different species. Uh, for example, um, we study their co coexistence or um, competitive exclusion and similarly for antigen uh, compositions in the populations, we can think of whether uh, certain antigens can, they can co-circulating in the population or whether one new antigens will competitively exclude the older ones. And now uh, when we talk about abundance, uh, rank abundance of uh, curves of different species in the community and their succession histories, for antigens in, this, in the population, we can also describe their diversity uh, patterns and then think of the turnover and establishment of new uh, genes as a kind of uh, strain level uh, assembly processes. And then when we <coughs> think about the species as generalists or specialists that are in terms of their resource use, uh, usage, um, similarly for antigens, they could elicit uh, cross reactive uh, immune memories for the host or whether they only elicit very specific memories. So uh, these kind of analogies um, are actually uh, uh, very importantly um, at the finalist level, we can also borrow a similar uh, coexistence theory that developed by Chesson to understand um, the finest differences between different antigens. So um, for example, um, for uh, antigens at as, as the functional level, they need to bind to different kinds of receptors um, in the host. And then if there's any new mutations that change the shape of the, um, change the shape of the original antigen so that their binding is not uh, optimal anymore, there's uh, differences in their uh, functional fit, uh, fitness. So then we can, uh, these kind of selection are um, these kind of selection, we call them directional selection so that they influence um, the growth rate uh, difference between different uh, antigens. While um, our immune system, they secrete antibodies to target these antigens. Uh, so then there's any uh, conformational differences in the mutations so that change the shape of the proteins uh, in, the, in the epitope sites that are targeted by antibodies, then uh, here balancing selection, uh, so-called immune selection will be at work uh, to um, select for new antigens that can actually escape this kind of host immunity check. So at this uh, axis, on the X axis, we are actually showing um, a kind of negative, uh, negative frequency dependent selection. 
that is uh, selecting for genes that uh, differ in their niche space. So, if we consider each variant of the antigen gene as a species, then we can actually directly borrow the framework from coexistence theory to study the long-term evolution pattern of this antigen gene family as an ecological community dynamics in a two gene scenario as the cross immunity, so, so called the niche divergence increases two genes, uh, they can both e exist in the population. Alternatively, if two genes, uh, they have this functional, uh, uh, gene, uh, functional level differences. So, uh, so we call them um, absolute fitness differences, then uh, one gene would take over. And if we draw a diagonal line, uh, given the position of the two genes along these two axes, we can actually decide whether they could coexist or one gene would uh, actually uh, take over. So this is only uh, the scenario of two genes, but what about large gene families with uh, constant innovation and different strategies to survive uh, for the genes within the gene family? So in this study, we would like to investigate coexistence of a large gene family that, uh, that is the major uh, uh, fun uh, antigens of malaria. So uh, in malaria transmission, there are actually very uh, important, uh, three important epidemiological characteristics that are uh, rarely observed in other kinds of diseases. First is that it, um, hosts, they do not have a sterile immunity in, even in endemic, in endemic regions, which means that even for adults here that we can see that a large proportion of the population, they constantly carry these parasites uh, year round, uh, not just in the wet season, but also in the dry season, which means that they, uh, it forms a really large asymptomatic transmission uh, reservoir. And then the symptomatic ones are only at the tip of an iceberg. And then uh, these kind of transmissions are usually um, um, because of a very large, caused by a very large uh, hyper diverse pool of parasites. And then um, the key driver for this really large reservoir is the antigenic variation. So while under the microscope, when we see these infected red blood cells as the same type of parasites, from the perspective of the immune system, actually, uh, the parasites infecting these individual red blood cells are wearing very different masks uh, during the asexual rep, uh, uh, blood transmission stage. And this is largely due to the extreme diversity displayed by our surface uh, protein, PFEMP1, which is encoded by the bar gene family. And this level of diversity um, is observed at different levels. So within the genome of a single parasite, each genome has about 60 different copies of these uh, VAR genes, um, which they encode the uh, different variants of, of the same surface protein. And during the, uh, the, during the infection, actually, the parasites can change uh, uh, expression from one to the other Thus, they can display different masks to our immune system one at a time for, the, for a very long period of um, infection duration. Um, and then um, at, a, a, at a population level, we observe a really diverse pool of gene variants. So in very high endemic regions, there's this enormous pool of diversity um, that's shown here uh, as a diversity accumulation curve built from the sampling in Gabon children uh, in the village from our collaborator, uh, which reveals more than 6,000 different kinds of large gene types as, as you sample. And then the curve is very far from saturation, uh, which means that if we actually sample um, uh, a random combination of genes to, uh, to become uh, different strains, there's a uh, uh, in, an astronomical num possible combinations that we can get.
And the driving force for this diversification is, a, is quite different from normal speciation process. Um, the diversification for this antigenic um, gene, uh, for this gene family in malaria is uh, through recombination processes. And there are two types of recombination uh, in the system that both uh, promote diversification policies. One is the meiotic recombination, which creates new strains. And this happens in the sexual reproduction stage within the mosquito. So then different combinations of genomes, they can shuffle their components with each other during this sexual uh, recombination stage. And more importantly, during the uh, asexual cycles within the host, there's another type of recombination called ectopic recombination. And this, occur, uh, this occurs between two different uh, genes from the same gene family uh, in the genome. Uh, and it can happen at any stage of the uh, reproduction cycles so that some of the, uh, the fragments from the two genes, they can recombine and uh, become a new a gene in the, within, the, within the genomes, therefore creating potentially new antigenic variants. And uh, we, have, we have talked about how this uh, enormous diversity can be observed both at the uh, gene level. So then we have a super large pool of the local genetic diversity of this gene and also at the level of combination of the genes. So uh, if, we, uh, if we, we, we then connect how, this, uh, how we can think about this uh, antigens as a community of species, we can, we can consider these different gene variants as uh, uh, different phenotypic traits. Um, and then uh, the gene pool is basically the possible tra trait space. And then each strain is a, a combination is a combination of these strains to become individual competitors between each other. And here we want to uh, focus on the, the, the generation of these different uh, gene variants. That is basically the gene pool and the trait space. And we want to know if there is any kinds of threshold for this antigenic diver diversification processes. So that is it possible that at a, at a certain regime, um, at a certain regime <clears throat> below this threshold, the gene pool is kind of constant, but then above this threshold, the diversification process is really fast. And this would be very important, very uh, <clears throat> important for us to understand malaria transmission. So basically we know that if we reduce the <clears throat> transmission intensities in the, in, in the system, we will of course decrease the antigenic diversity um, in, in the population. But what we don't know is how this uh, that decrease occurs and in per particular whether it involves a threshold transition. So this is try to uh, complement the traditional are not uh, concepts of describing whether a, an epidemic will occur. Here we focus on uh, like investigating this different um, epidemiological measure that can um, define a threshold, basically describing this diversification processes of antigens um, and whether we can separate these two kinds of regimes. The reason why we think it exists, uh, such a threshold exists is because um, each gene, when they, when they come into the system, they need to uh, pass through several kinds of drift processes. Uh, and because they first need to dominate in the parasite population within the host and then get transmitted to at least one person uh, before the end of the infection. And also they need to be propagated in the population um, com uh, to compete with other kinds of existing antigens. So therefore, uh, we, we, are, we would imagine there's such kind of threshold um, for one scenario below this diversification threshold, uh, an, a new gene uh, just come and then sometimes goes. And then these kind of new genes, they don't really overlap with each other. So then they don't really accumulate in the population. 
while above this diversification threshold, uh, we would observe a lot of overlapping lifespan of new genes, and then some of them would be uh, lasting in the population. So basically, we are imagined that the establishment of such uh, genes would be possible when the average death rate of these genes would be uh, lower than their generation rate. Uh, is there any questions so far? Uh, I don't see questions in the chat or in the participant list, but if anyone wants to ask uh, uh, something, otherwise I think we can move on. Okay, great. So basically, um, how we are going to uh, propose this uh, epi new epidemiological threshold is first that we consider the rate of generation of these new mutations. And this basically um, uh, is determined by the population size of the parasites um, and then the generation rate of new um, mutations. And here mutations, uh, I refer to both the uh, real mutations and also recombination uh, processes in, in this system. Um, and, then we, and then we consider for these new mutations, we need to um, calculate their invasion probability because uh, if they create something that antigenically different, then they have an advantage to uh, replace the existing ones because they have a higher uh, potential host immunity resources to, to still be depleted. Uh, to ha uh, ha that haven't been depleted. Um, and then also we need to consider the functional level fitness of these uh, new genes because they might not be functional uh, in binding anymore. So then these genes will also be selected out. So this P invasion probability here, we are considering their, uh, both their functional level uh, fitness and also their niche um, divergence compared to other, other <clears throat> existing antigens. And then we um, will, and then we can, we then compare it to the death rate of these genes. Basically, we call it uh, uh, T nu. Uh, one over T nu is the death rate, and T nu is the overall life lifespan of these genes. Um, and then, so then uh, we uh, we call this epidemiological threshold as RD, and it's the product between G nu and T nu. Basically. Um, is uh, uh, n times uh, mu times p inversion and then a uh, p invasion and then t nu. Uh, so um, in the uh, to confirm this uh, the existence of this uh, threshold, we model a realistic diverse uh, uh, real, a realistic stochastic individual based stochastic model to uh, incorporate recombination, mutation, and migration processes that create a population that is open to constant innovation. And also in the paper that is going to be in press, uh, we, uh, we list the analytical approximation of how we calculate this P uh, invasion and also um, approximation from solving uh, diffusion equations for T nu to actually have um, an um, uh, uh, an approximation for this quantity. Um, so if you're interested, you can um, refer to that paper for specific equations if you are interested. Um, is there any questions so far? Uh, well, I, I had a question that I actually wrote in the chat and, uh, but I think it's oh. a good discussion. Uh, I mean, okay. Yeah, so I think we can move on. Uh, it's not really a clarification. Okay, yeah. So, um, so our numerical simulation actually uh, confirmed that there is a sharp transition between uh, these two regimes. So here, uh, what I'm showing on the x-axis is the uh, log value of RD that we calculate from the um, simulations. And then the y-axis uh, shows the percentage of new genes that we um, calculate at the end of each simulation. And then each uh, point here represents a simulation with different combinations of parameters. Uh, 
for example, within host dynamic, different within host dynamics rules, strength of trade-off and uh, transmission rates and seasonalities. And then, uh, so, so therefore this, uh, we see this threshold uh, that is robust to uh, different assumptions and parameter combinations. So, um, so here that we see that um, above the threshold of RD larger than one, which is log RD larger than zero, there's a, a fast accumulation of new genes, but below this threshold, there's hardly any accumulation of the genes. And then um, on the right, I'm showing uh, that actually uh, the transmission intensities, which is uh, measured in malaria system as the entomological inoculation rate, uh, they, uh, they increases monotonically with RD. Uh, but why do we still need to, to use the RD value instead of the direct, direct uh, calculation of this entomological inoculation rate is because we know that with reduction of this uh, um, inoculation rate, uh, antigenic diversity reduces, but we don't really know where this uh, transition occurs um, that will uh, allow us to predict that the system would be uh, having a more constant pool of antigens uh, instead of uh, fast accumulation of, of new antigens. And I also want to note here that um, all of these um, are endemic transmissions, which means that they are uh, they are well above the traditional are are not threshold that predicts the epidemics whether the epidemics can, can be sustained. So all of these uh, conditions they have constant transmission. Okay, so. Um, and then here I'm showing you how actually uh, below and above the threshold, how the, the accumulation of different new genes um, uh, the, are different. So um, on the X axis are different years and then on the Y axis are the fre frequencies of these new genes. So gray color here uh, indicates very low frequency of new genes. And then the other colors and coloring the ones that are relatively more abundant when they were generated. And then we can see that below the threshold, new genes are generated, but then their lifespan are usually really short. And then, um, so then they come and go and they, they don't really stay in the system. So at this regime, they are more uh, governed by stochastic processes uh, rather than their fitness um, compared to other new genes. While above this threshold, if we look at how the generation of uh, new genes, uh, it's, it's a sharp, it's a really sharp difference from the previous graph that we see new genes, they would be generated and they don't really easily uh, got lost in the, in the system. Rather, they, they kind of persist at a low frequency, but they, they persist for a really long time in, in, the, in the population. And then the general, uh, the, 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 the accumulation of new genes is really fast. So um, how, does the, how will this threshold actually help us understand uh, the effectiveness of interventions in, in these transmissions or uh, whether we can actually uh, met, uh, quantify our effort in uh, the effectiveness of interventions in the system? So, so here we look at how uh, antigenic diversification, whether they recover or not, if we reduce the transmission intensity below this RD threshold. And then what we found is that um, if, if the uh, transmission um, rate was uh, reduced, but then not uh, below the threshold, then after the intervention, um, the new genes will still accumulate and then um, dominant in the system uh, uh, together with the other genes that were generated before this intervention. So, so here the dotted line indicates uh, when the interven intervention started. And then if they were reduced below this uh, threshold of IDIV, uh, 
then the accumulation of new genes are um, very slow uh, compared to the other existing new genes. Um, are there any questions so far? I don't see uh, any question in the chat. So I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, and then, um, so then like we would like to know whether um, measuring this uh, quantity would also uh, give us advice um, that about the, how will the system uh, respond in terms of epidemi epidemiological quantities um, compared to other existing measures. And then here, uh, so we reduce, we reduce, we quantify RD um, based on different percentage of reduction in the biting rate um, uh, colored as uh, different colors here. And then we, uh, we measure how the system respond to um, this, uh, all these different levels of interventions. And then we found that prevalence rate uh, in the host would, res would uh, recover really fast um, if the reduction of the um, biting rate doesn't push the system below RD um, equals one. But then if when the system was pushed below this threshold, then the prevalence rate and then the multiplicity of infection, they stay low and then they don't rebound um, as other, other scenarios, which means that if we measure this RD value in the field, it has practical guidance in terms of um, predicting how uh, the, the effectiveness of the intervention or how fast the system would rebound um, in, the, in the empirical settings. So here I'm, I'm just showing you one um, result from um, the analytical approximation of RD. Uh, as I mentioned that we developed an approximation for TNU uh, using an, a diffusion equation based on the frequency dependent selection. And here we don't really have uh, time to develop how I uh, achieved it, but then uh, I would like to just show you uh, the relationship between uh, uh, between TNU and then the proportion of susceptible uh, population, uh, the proportion of susceptible hosts uh, in the population. So basically, um, we see that the, the lifespan of a new gene is uh, most strongly correlated with the percentage of susceptible hosts. Basically, we can think of them as um, still usable host memory uh, immunity resource. And then once the once the uh, once the the population has a has a large amount of still available um, uh, open niches, then there um, then the new genes will not really have much advantage to um, invade the system. But then if uh, this resource is already de uh, depleted, which means that uh, S is very low, then there is a really high advantage, a really large advantage for new genes to, to be able to invade the system and then stay in the system for a long time. Um, so, and then a dotted line is basically time to fixation for, of a neutral variant. So once the system still um, ha has very less open space for the host immunity, then a new gene would be very, uh, have a, huge advantage, much higher, have a much higher lifespan than the normal neutral variant in the population. So uh, just to conclude from uh, what I have told you so far, um, we observe a sharp transition in the accumulation of antigenic variation that is related to transmission intensity. And then uh, this RD measure provides a very useful um, value to 
uh, to evaluating the effectiveness of intervention in controlling this antigenic diversification processes. And then once this threshold is across, is crossed, the epidemiological system should be more susceptible to further in, uh, interventions because the pool of the genes are relatively closed. And then, so the next step for our work is to actually have empirical estimation of RD, which will require a lot of fitting of the epidemiological and molecular data. So uh, in general, this concept uh, should be able to apply to other uh, infectious diseases, not just um, with, uh, and also mostly for the multi-gene families uh, or uh, gene families that have multi-locus, these kind of antigenic variation. And it also, um, we, we could also speculate that um, for community assembly processes, uh, a similar, uh, there could be potentially a similar threshold for diversification uh, due to the, uh, how these traits, how uh, the, whether these traits can be evolved fast, fast enough or not. Um, and then as Mercedes mentioned from the last talk, uh, we, we could also speculate that in these kind of really hyper diverse systems, hyper diverse ecosystems, there must be some kind of balancing selection uh, uh, negative frequencies dependent competition in work that um, ensures uh, or promote really high uh, diversity and then coexisting uh, coexistence of many different species. For example, the jensen kono hypothesis. Um, and then if you're interested, you can, you can see the, you can download the paper from BioArchive and then it should be out in plus computational biology soon. Thank you. Oh, and I would like to acknowledge my collaborators um, and a lot of uh, help for discussion from um, everyone from Pasquale's lab and Day's lab at University in Melbourne. And then my past uh, colleague, Shai Piosov, and now assistant professor and then Catherine Shazia and Karen from university at the University of Melbourne. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, so is there uh, uh, any question? I have one, but I want to give the priority to others. Well, I can ask uh, the, the question um, that I, that I um, have. So when you uh, calculate the, the um, uh, RD versus so this, uh, this transition point. It seems to me, I mean, the sort of uh, argument you have, it, think, it seems to me uh, sort of uh, uh, related to the transition between being in a periodic selection regime where you have a strain that uh, sort of a, um, a strain with a beneficial mutation that go to fixation and then uh, there is no interference between uh, uh, strains carrying uh, beneficial mutations. So the transition between this periodic selection regime and clonal interference, and uh, where instead you have multiple uh, strains with uh, beneficial mutations that interfere with, uh, with each other. So I was mm -hmm. wondering if the connection, uh, if there is actually a connection between RDIV and the, the transition between uh, periodic selection and, the, and uh, uh, clonal interference, or is just um, uh, they are two different, uh, completely two different things. Uh, you mean interference, uh, do you mean interference as uh, just a pure a competition between different strains or? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean that the, I mean, I, I mean interference in the sense that you have, um, um, you have multiple beneficial mutations that uh, sort of slow down the, the, the dynamics of uh, fixation and therefore you have coexistence of multiple benefi beneficial mutations because uh, they sort of slow down the, the time scale of having the competitors going, uh, of competitive exclusion, right? Because you have the two time scales, right? The time scales of the rise of a new mutation and the time scale of extinction, right? 
and uh, somehow there is a transition where uh, mutations are fast enough uh, that uh, you have these mutants and effectively they slow down, uh, they further slow down the, the time scale of extinction. So I was wondering if there is a connection there. Um, uh, there is a, there, there is, um, there, um, if, so, so when you have multiple, yes, so when you have multiple uh, new um, mutations, they would, it, usually they don't occur in the same, um, usually they don't occur simultaneously in the same host, um, but they, uh, when they're at low frequencies, they kind of do not really interfere with each other. But when they uh, reach a certain kind of frequencies at a population level, um, every gene in the population, they will have to be at a lower frequency. So it's kind of um, when you don't have a lot of diversity, then each new gene would be really uh, beneficial and then sweep into the population. Um, and then once you, you accumulate a large diversity, then each of them would suffer um, to, to a lower um, frequency at equilibrium just because you, ha you have a lot more composition. I don't know if, if, that, if that's what you're asking or it's different. Well, I, Shishin, just a yeah. comment. The problem is that clonal interference, at least in microbial communities uh, or microbial evolution, I think is, is very different than what we have here in the typical models. Because generally it is really mutations in the, what you call the functional axis so the, that affect the fitness and then there is competition for some resources. So I don't think clonal interference refers to this uh, negative frequency dependence competition that is specific competition and, uh, and forms niches. I don't think it does, I th not in the traditional way it is modeled. So I think if you want to actually promote diversity, normal interference has to be specific, specific competition. competition. And it's not the kind, uh, I think it refers, it's not necessarily treated as, uh, as you know, this, this access that, that, that has to do with niche formation and niche formation under, under interactions. It's really affecting traits that influence the fitness of the microbes and how much access to the resources they have. So it's the orthogonal access mm -hmm. to the one that really forms a structure of dissimilarity uh, and the interaction of ecology and evolution that we are talking about here. But it's, it's difficult because it is the way competition is thought about and uh, you have to relate, I guess, to the specific assumptions of competition when people talk loosely about clonal interference. Yeah, I see. There is another question by Aditya. Uh, who is asking when you are past the diversification threshold, what sets the time scale of the turnover of biodiversity? Does each strain stick around indefinitely or do they turn over at some rate? Uh, yeah, this is a very good question. Um, so the time scale uh, of turnover is set by many different conditions of the transmission. So as I mentioned, um, when the, as I mentioned, when the trend, uh, the, so basically when the transmission rate um, is high in the, in the system, which means that the competition, uh, the population size is large and then the competition for hosts is strong, then um, the, 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 the new genes, uh, so the new genes will be uh, more preferred and then these these kind of genes will uh, stick around in the in the population for very long, but then uh, if the pop if the um, if the transmission when the transmission rate is very low, and then um, the their uh, new genes cannot be ensured to um, have 
to be promoted into uh, and then propagated in the population. Um, a lot of them would be very short lived, but the ones that actually pass through these kind of um, drift barriers, they can still persist really long in the in the population. So um, it's very interesting that um, basically we can partition these new genes into short lived ones and then the very long lived ones that basically could indefinitely be incorporated in the system, such as a lot of other immune related genes or um, HLA genes, these kind of large, um, these kind of um, like immune related genes, uh, because they are under balancing selection, they could be um, maintained in the population um, much longer than sometimes than the species, uh, the, 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 the sometimes lo even longer than the species themselves. So would you, would you say that the majority of the diversity is coming from the fact that new genes are entering at a high rate or is it coming from the fact that um, the successful genes are sticking around for a long time? So, like, uh, we, yeah, so for the long-term evolution, it is because the uh, balancing selection that these um, genes persist in the system for a long time, but mm -hmm. they could be really old. Mm-hmm.